Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So today I wanted to bring up the case of Katie Meyer of Stanford University. She was the captain of the women's soccer team. And yes, I say was because she's no longer with us. And her parents are trying to find justice and demand accountability from the university. And this has been going on for a while, but around Thanksgiving, so a few weeks ago, they formally filed their lawsuit. And if you see from their recent interviews and interviews from about nine months ago when the incident happened, you really see an eerily familiar sense of heartbreak and grief of parents who have lost their child. And it is still left as a question mark, especially when it comes to an institution or some sort of entity, people in power who are being called to take responsibility and then there's a roadblock. So they, when I saw this again, they seem to be very similar to the parents who are still reeling from the Itaewon Halloween crowd crush incident. And I wanted to draw some parallels, but really focus today's episode on the Katie Meyer case and whether the university should be held responsible or not for the passing away of this star athlete and academic who was about to go to Stanford Law School. So to give you a quick update on what's been going on with the Itaewon crowd crush, there have been calls by the National Assembly, the liberal camp, to fire the interior minister. The interior minister is the top line person in the government that would activate safety protocols and mobilize forces. And at question right now, the biggest one is where were the riot police when it comes to the interior minister's role because that's much uh that's a you know big national level these riot patrols they're squadrons where there are about 50 to 80 people per unit and at any given time there may be about eight of them doing their duty and most of them were mobilized to protect key areas on the day of the Itaewon crowd crush incident uh, where there were anti-president and anti-government protests going on. So people were saying like, well, where were these riot patrols? And a lot of them actually are young kids who are fulfilling their military duty. And what they were doing on the day of the ET1 crowd crush on Halloween was essentially throughout the day there were a lot of rallies and protests. So they were guarding Yoido, which is where the National Assembly is. So just imagine that's like the Capitol building of uh, Washington, D.C. Kwangamun, which is the central part where we had the candlelight uh, rallies that impeached President Park. The presidential office complex in Yongsan, which is essentially walking distance from Itaewon. I've done that walk before. And the Chinese embassy, the U.S. embassy, and the Japanese embassies. But where people are getting a little bit upset is that actually two squadrons were guarding the president's private apartment home because I guess he still was transitioning to the new residence that's not the blue house. So his, you know, apartment complex in Gangnam, that's where he'd been commuting back and forth from. There were two squadrons that were there and one stayed there. And in a way, of course, you should always have the president protected, but it does show like uh, uh, this kind of like bungling of, of long-term planning of these resources being stretched thin. After about an hour or so after when it started to get deadly in the Itaewon crowd crush, the first riot patrol units started to get mobilized 
to the area, and it took a long time for other units to finally arrive to the scene. So they're really investigating that portion of how everything went wrong. I mean, again, there were calls like flooding in around 6 p.m. So the first units were close to 11 p.m. that started to arrive to try to manage the crowd. But, you know, by then, that that's so too late too late what were they going to do these were not you know these aren't the the type of police officers that are there for you know basically active crowd management or health patrol or all these kind of things they're usually those guys that you see they're just stand standing in a row or placed at strategic points to try to make sure there's a police presence to dissuade people from going you know crazy in a crowd but you know a lot of these kids they're they're literally like kids they're either like before college or during college young 20s and they are fulfilling their military duty and this is part of the, you know, one of the units you can go to. Ironically, yeah, they're sending Jin tomorrow to his military enlistment. And all these people fulfilling their military duty were protecting the president who didn't even go to the military himself. But that's another episode. So the parents are continuing to try to fight and press for a real apology and a real accountability from the government. And some of the quotes recently that I saw were very moving, but also, again, underscoring the, the unfortunate way that I don't think the legal system can address their heartbreak. And so one person said, I don't know what happened to my son in the last hours of his life, where he was, how he was found, and if he was given help. I'm just an ordinary mom. I don't know politics, but I know that you have to apologize for what you did wrong. I always taught my son that the president of this country should apologize to our children. The least you can do is apologize. So really, they're not looking for money. They're not looking to put somebody in jail. They real uh, an apology would go a long way. But I think a lot of times these politicians are thinking like, well, once you apologize, you open the door for, you know, the legal action to come and maybe they could end up in jail. Maybe they could get impeached. Maybe they could face some sort of fines or hits to their political career. So, yeah, they're not really apologizing. Another person said that none of us want to be here. We are parents who lost our children. We don't know why we have to be out in the streets like this to be listened to. Explain what you mean. You can speak with us. Don't treat us like we are an anti-government group. And when you look at the Seoul Ferry incident and all of the parents who were demanding justice back then, they started to get labeled as anti-government because, yeah, their beef was with the government, but then people were taking advantage of that and started labeling them as if they were anti-government radicals. And again, this is the unfortunate vulnerable position that they're in is that they're the David against the Goliath, but, you know, without really having that heart with, I don't know, did he have a slingshot or a, a, a rock? These parents don't want to throw rocks and they just want an apology. But unfortunately, if you want to be the David against the Goliath, you better have some very finely sharpened rocks and a good arm. Otherwise, these calls for an apology just will not work against the Goliath. And I think that's a very sad situation because it's a very normal human reaction, especially of people who don't play, you know, they're not, they don't inhabit this world of cobwebs and manipulation and politics and things like that. They are just looking and trusting their government, which by the way, if you didn't have the people's trust, you wouldn't have the power and you wouldn't have a government to begin with. So, you know, you're also, uh, you know, uh, walking on fine on thin ice if you're taking your people's trust in your government for granted. And so they're just asking for 
an explanation to trying to like close that heartbreak in their heart. But again, I don't think that the legal system is a place where you can sue for an apology. You really do have to find a way to tie a legal outcome to whether that would satisfy your emotion. But you can't just go in there thinking like, I need my emotion satisfied with something nebulous of some sort of declaration by judge. I think what they're really looking for is the a judge is gonna be more of like this fatherly figure or motherly, grandmotherly figure, grandfatherly figure that dispenses like this is what society should be like. And you're not gonna get that because you know, and that grandpa, that grandma, oh, they <laughs> they sold their they they done sold everything a long time ago. And sticks and stones, I don't know. It only takes one crazy parent to make the point, just saying. And so now transitioning over to the Stanford case. Katie Meyer and her parents, obviously grief stricken. And so I didn't really follow this case uh, that much. And recently, because they had officially filed their wrongful death lawsuit against Stanford University, it came back into the news. It first popped onto the scene when she had taken her own life at Stanford in the dorm uh, in February, late February of this year, 2022. And there was a lot of coverage around that, but then now it's come back. Now, so Stanford is saying that they are not responsible for her death. And the parents are saying that, yes, you are, or there should be some accountability or some explanation as to how this all happened because this seemed to have come out of the blue. Now, what happened. She's a star soccer player. She, by all intents and purposes, was doing great. She was, looks like, on her way to uh, hearing back from Stanford Law School. She was a senior. She was the captain of the women's football, of, of soccer team. And she was really just, you know, cranking it out like, like those Stanford students do. But underneath it all, she was dealing, we all deal, we all dealt with like very high pressure, but she was dealing with a lingering disciplinary action because, so okay, she ended her life in late February 2022, but back in August of 2021, so if you're looking at the school year, it was the beginning of that school year and they were... She was there in August, and it looks like she was probably there for preseason training because she's an athlete. You know, most of us uh, started in September or late September uh, with the actual schoolwork. So she was on campus, and there was an incident where she spilled coffee. The official word is that she spilled coffee on a football player, whether she threw it in his face or, you know, it dribbled or whatnot. I mean, the... <laughs> The point was, is that he, I guess he was just like, oh, like a big football player. He was like, oh, I knew this girl attacked me with coffee. I'm going to go report her. So this thing got reported. Why did, why did apparently she, she do that? Well, she was sticking up for her friend, a fellow athlete. And apparently that football player is, was accused of SA or kissing or doing something to her friend that the friend did not like and they were mad and you know these athletes are they're all going to be in a heightened state of you know um alertness and uh reactions and so what coffee like you know even if she threw a pot of coffee at a football player i mean aren't they like you know getting like 300 pounds of force like you know bashed into them like every like day in in practice and in in the games and let me tell you I when I was at Stanford and I had to take a seat in a lecture hall I was a little bit late it was a boring history class but 
there was an empty spot. I was like, oh, okay, it's sort of near the front. And there was like these two big football players who were sitting and there was an empty spot. I was like, okay, well, I'll just sit in the empty spot. There was a reason why there was an empty spot because the body heat that these two were emitting, it was like having a sauna on both sides. And I was sitting there, I was just like, oh my God, how am I going to get through the end of this lecture? Because this heat is just killing me. And so look, a little bit of hot coffee coffee on a football player? I don't think so. I don't think so. I wish I had a cup of coffee that day because sometimes you bring the coffee, it's a boring lecture and you know it chilled on the way there. I, it would have been great if I if I could have just you know put it up next to the football players and like warmed up my coffee. A little bit of hot coffee is not going to hurt a big football player and for and and, and and also the football player himself shouldn't be going running off and telling the teacher saying like, oh, this girl spilled coffee on me. We should create some disciplinary action on her. But what that did was set off this chain reaction where they were like they brought in. And now this is kind of scary. Once you bring in like the whole force of the institution of Stanford, it can be quite scary. Very intimidating. And it was essentially an open period of six months of an investigation that Stanford itself said that they had their time limit on. So this kind of situation is now where I start to see Stanford weaponized the system, the legal system, their institutions system their codes of con whatever kind of like judicial like whether it's like just a judicial system within the university and where there it spills out into the actual real legal system they were using tactics that that big players use like big corporations use to bully and to wear out their opponents they had six months to come up with some sort of response to this disciplinary action. So you don't realize this and probably the even the administrators, if they've never gone through this, they probably don't realize this. But you might think like, oh, I have six months to get to this paperwork and they probably just see it as paperwork. But for Katie Meyer, that student, it is waking up every day thinking, worrying, anxiety, even if it's on a low level, even if, you know, I'm sure she was saying like, oh, this isn't, I'm not bothered by this, or it seems like they forgot about it, or I'm focusing on my studies, my applications, like my schoolwork, my sports, I got so much going on. It's always there in the back of your mind. And always when you wake up, you have kind of a little bit of a fear response of like, what's going to happen to my life? Because that part is out of my control and I haven't heard back yet and this part I think people completely have missed from this story because a lot of people haven't gone through this but I'll tell you the when if you if you just or if you just even ask a lawyer part of the tactics of if you're in the if you're in the wrong and if you are in the position of being wrong plus having power and fancy legal expertise and a team then what you do is you try to delay your part as long as possible you take as much time as you can to write up your case and get all of the facts or manipulate the facts or whatnot and then boom you give it to your opponent at the last possible minute so that's what they did on the deadline of the last day that they were supposed to give her a response at 7 p.m they sent her a six page email response that was very very intimidating and i would argue was weaponized it was literally like a weapon threatening expulsion saying that it was only a matter of time for them to move forward with disciplinary action that would trigger basically holding her diploma or canceling her diploma getting her out of stanford and basically canceling all of the work that she did and her chances to go on to law school when you do something like that to even a middle-aged person you fire somebody they say if you get fired it's almost like witnessing your own death and it is traumatic even for somebody who is middle-aged imagine a girl who is not even what like 22 20 i think she's probably 22 if she was a senior 
barely just out of adolescence and going into the world, you hit her with something like that, that is an attack. That is a weaponized form of attack that usually you have to wait a few more decades to get into that world if then and you know play among that type of power weaponizing it against one of your own and so i could see how shocking this might be to her in this situation in some interviews people who are very experienced with high level athletes in this type of environment say that being an athlete is who you are it's not what you do. And if Stanford was going forward with this and threatening to take away that f from her, that is literally like taking away the foundation of your identity. And if you've never been in that situation before, it doesn't sound, oh, it sounds so intangible, but that intangible essentially is your everything. It is the core of your person. And when you get older, you try to make sure that you disassociate yourself from like, you know, you are not just an athlete, you are you. So if somebody takes away the athlete part, you are still you. But especially at a younger age, you are told that everything that you were able to do and accomplish and, and, and who you are and why you're good and why you're at Stanford is because you're this star athlete, because of all your academic performance they're gonna chop all of those off right when you're about to enter the world that is a dev that literally is like murder that is a weaponized attack in the non-physical and in the real real world and for somebody to go through that on her own at 7 p.m on a friday night and read this six page email with all this legal jargon with threats in it from the university that she had poured her life into and had trusted, I think that really does have a devastating effect. Now, what I found also ironic is that they took six months, right? This is uh, this is why I say these are the red flags of gaslighting and, and weaponization from the institution or at least from the peop the particular staff members who are working for the institution. Sometimes you can't, you know, you can't blame the whole Stanford University, you know, institution for this. But in, in some ways, they have to take responsibility. But they took six months and like you know like somebody who, like well, i kind of did like you know the last minute you send in your paper well they at the last minute sent in this whole thing saying like oh well we're actually still not done yet but it's only a matter of time when we collect all the pieces and, and you know you going to jail essentially you're gonna get your diploma threatened you're gonna get your whole status as a Stanford student uh, affected and then that goes on your record and then who knows maybe she can't go to Stanford Law School. They told her that she had by Monday to get her evidence to them otherwise it, the investigation would move forward not in her favor. That is weaponization. What was she supposed to do on the weekend? Even if she had like a family lawyer to call, there it's the weekend that, you know, and of course, you know, I bet lawyers, they, they will sacrifice everything sometimes to work on the weekends as well. But that compresses the amount of capacity for her to respond and to actually strengthen her position this whole time. They're stringing her along, not really saying anything, giving her a false sense of security or maybe that this is going to go away. But then, boom, it comes back and it's not like a light thing like, OK, well, let's let's um, re let's revisit this issue. It's a force. It is an attack. And then she's told that she has until Monday to to bring her evidence to defend herself against this attack what is a 22 year old girl without a legal team supposed to do in that situation how is she going to feel and so what happened is that 
later, uh, I guess apparently later that night or maybe over the weekend, she did take her life. And there are questions about this whole thing, but they were able to do legal, uh, 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 technological forensics on her computer. And they said that they were showing how like she was toggling back and forth from the email with the whole six pages of legal jargon and then trying and how to defend herself against it. She was like Googling and trying to find out ways on how to respond. Maybe she found like she, she just, that it was just something that she couldn't win and then it's the whole her whole world probably started to crumble because this was such a huge hit now she did respond to them relatively immediately saying that she was distraught by this email and stanford one of the people who you know maybe the person who sent it or somebody on that side who sent her the six page email responded in a within the hour saying like okay well why don't we meet next week and discuss it and so from Stanford's perspective they're saying that we did respond to her she reached out um, after we sent the email and we told her like hey let's meet next week so why are we being blamed now the family though is saying that they disregarded the email and her frustration or her um, panic. And so that was a bit, I think, misconstrued in the media because people were saying, or, you know, actually, you know, if you're on the PR team, like this, what you would do is basically like, no, we, we did not uh, disregard the email. We responded to the email. But then the parents are saying like, no, it's not that we're saying like you disregarded the email, you disregarded her panic and you left her alone in her dorm to fend for herself no mental health resources now this is where i start to think that this is again a red flag of gaslighting why should she be in the first place why should the discussion be about like there weren't enough mental health resources for her to respond to this attack that's almost like saying like yeah, I got stabbed, but why did the stabber not leave me enough bandages or some gauze or ointment or maybe even a phone number to call to go to the emergency room to deal with the stabbing? And then the debate is over, hmm, should, I mean, is it the responsibility of the stabber to provide the medical resources after and never ever talk about the stabbing or whether it was a real attack or not it should not be about the resources although there should have been resources and that is important but the real question though is whether this was an attack or not and by focusing it on like oh whether whether the university was responsible for the mental health resources or not that's a slick move and when i see slick i see a red flag and that points me to look further to see if there is gaslighting and i think there definitely is in this case and that is a smooth way to operate if you're going to fight this as if you're like a big corporation, but this is where it gets a little bit sad, is that you're fighting one of your own. This is your own student. This is one of your own star students. I mean, like, I always thought like, oh gosh, you know, these like athletes at Stanford, like, you know, what, they, they got the whole world, you know, like they, all of the resources, all the attention, you know, but I had no idea, like, you know, even them, they can get really attacked by, their own university well i mean they even used her on pr posters and stuff like this so you can see how much like if you have been the favored player or person at the how far you have to fall and then this university is just going to take that from you what a scary 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 concept that would be and again i want to emphasize that this intangible death this intangible attack, this intangible murder, I would say, is much harder than physical. They won't 
harm you physically. And I will attest to that fact because I almost got run over, I think I've told you before, by Condoleezza Rice, you know, in her Mercedes. You know, she was like a vice provost and the president of the university once in their cars. But, you know, both both times my fault. Totally my fault. Like, you know, I was biking and... uh you know, they have us bike like crazy going to classes and stuff like overworking us. So maybe it's a little bit, you know, maybe the responsibility should be shared. But on the whole, I think it was my fault, like just being a reckless biker and they stopped and they, you know, they did not. And thank goodness they didn't, you know, they won't harm you physically. I mean, if you're trying to like launch a coup in Nicaragua or Guatemala, like, you know, maybe you might find airplanes dropping out of the sky or, you know, cars hitting you, but at least in Palo Alto, they're not going to hit you physically. But if you cross them, you better believe if you cross Miss Condoleezza in her Ferragamos and her Hermes scarf, and if she gets mad, she gonna, she will destroy you. They will destroy you, but like a politically, financially, academically, like they'll take the things away from from you if you threaten them or you cross um the line and here i think what she katie was being made an example of is that she was threatening the football program and the sports program unfortunately even at stanford even though like you'd think that at stanford you don't even need the sports because the amount of amazing academic research and innovation that comes out of there seems like it wouldn't really need like a sports program to prop it up but sports unfortunately is the glue that links alumni back to the school and helps them donate in large sums in order for all of that innovation to continue and when you have the pecking order men's football like american football versus women's soccer yeah there's a huge gap and so the men's football team essentially i would say yeah it's probably the top dog in terms of which sport brings the most amount of prestige and uh, alumni participation back to the school. So she was rattling the money cage of the football team. And, oh, you know, and again, like, you know, this, this also kind of is an eye opener for me and, you know, makes me much more empathetic because I was like, you know, I was thought like, oh, you know, like these privileged blonde girls, like, you know, don't they got it all. And, um, you know, it, it's just mind boggling that that she would even be so maliciously attacked posthumously. And even during the whole process, like she like when I'm looking back at like how what she had to go through, I'm like, wow, she she it looks like she was struggling like a minority too. And so I felt really um I well, on one hand, I felt really bad about like you know assuming that um, you know this kind of thing couldn't happen to her or uh, people you know like her, and then I felt really bad that it did happen to her, and then her parents like look so similar to the grief stricken Sewell Fairy parents, the grief stricken Ite One Crowd Crush parents. And essentially, it's like helpless against an institution you don't want to hate. The people in Korea, the parents of both of those tragedies, they don't want to hate Korea. They don't want to hate the Korean government. They don't even want to hate the politicians. They just want an apology. They just want answers. Katie Meyer's parents, obviously, you can see, they don't want to hate Stanford at all. They just want an apology. And this is something that I think they're going to have to really quickly you know, try to come to grips with unless they want to, you know, go through a long grief process. But it's 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 almost like a, a, a mind puzzle that is 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 thrust upon you that you never wanted, never expected. And nobody tells you how to unravel this Rubik's Cube of basically separating out like, look, there is the legal question and then your own personal question. Their personal question is essentially they want some sort of closing of the 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 gap, the loop, the the answer, the 
just to put something to to rest a lot of that you know does depend on some sort of apology explanation and clear facts and if the other side is deflecting on those to basically keep themselves away from some huge legal accountability that's not gonna help them with that on the other hand their deflecting is actually in a more winning position and structurally the legal question is tough and only depends on whether somebody fought for that legal question before and passed the law is there a way for the parents to prove that that email essentially is responsible for a suicidal death can they actually prove or is there a law even for them to prove that was violated that that kind of a message like that and an attack like that could prompt somebody to take their lives and whether that person or institution that sent that message is responsible that's a tough tough place because i haven't heard of that because honey if there were if that was the case if messages like that and attacks like that were liable for people's deaths then i think we would see a lot more cases of that come out here but i just don't think there is a lot and that's for their legal team that's the legal that's why you pay the lawyers to try to find out if there is that kind of situation when we look at the psycho river killer case here in korea where the wife and her boyfriend gaslit the husband into jumping off the waterfall and you know basically intimidating and bullying and all that kind of stuff the judge did find that they were responsible for the death of the husband even though he jumped himself into the water the first court uh ruling essentially said that they are liable of course the psycho river killer girl and her boyfriend or boy toy are going to appeal and they're in the appeals process just in case you wanted an update on that and so at least you know here in korea there had been some ruling about like you know your words can be liable for somebody taking an action that could end their lives so there may be something like that on the books in cal in california or in the united states who knows but I think that what has been not really emphasized and has been minimized or overlooked is the question of whether this message itself was weaponized and lethal. Not whether, instead of like the question being put, posed right now, is whether or not the university provided enough mental health resources for her after she got this email so again it's sort it's again like it's whether this was a knife that was used to attack katie through the legal system not whether the person holding the life a knife should have given her some bandages it's not about the bandages it's about whether this email, this whole process, this disciplinary process was weaponized against her and whether that led her to her demise. And if you're wondering if I ever had that institution of Stanford weaponized against me, I'd say, yeah, well, I was always trying to like stir up some, I, you know, they call it good trouble now, right? But like, you know, I'll tell you, Stanford, you have a hate crime policy because Miho Tanaka, who's now a great orthopedic surgeon, and I, back in 2001, led this campaign for a hate crime policy for Stanford University because there was hate, there's, somebody went into like a bunch of classrooms and, and on the chalkboards wrote all of these like swastikas and racial um, epithets and just like all the shocking stuff. And they're just like, oh, okay, you know, like whatever. But, we were just like no this is a total affront to the students and it's it's attacks and so 
we, you know, really weren't that concerned about like trying to find like who did it. We were just wondering what is the university response and what is their policy? And we found that they didn't have one. And so now I think you have one because I've heard that the hate crime policy had been implemented in some certain areas. So yes, you can thank Sean for stirring up some good trouble back then. And so that's not where I got the institution against me. This was some other trivial matter, but I had been called into some sort of like the residential education office. And this, I'll just call her Little Miss C because, or not, not because of, not, not because of CU next Tuesday, although, but because, because, um, one of her initials was C. And she even had like the audacity to invoke Jesus on me saying like, oh, I hope I pray because to Jesus that let you that, you know, what you did like is not going to harm. I was like, what are you talking? This it, it was very strange. Like she was trying, but there was not like anything she can do. And in the end, she couldn't really do much. And essentially, what was it? Basically, I was an RA, which is, you know, resident uh, advisor. So, you know, you're like one of like the, the team that, you know, like the student staff of a dorm. And it was the end of this, this uh, spring semester. We were going into summer and a lot of other schools end earlier than Stanford. And so I got an internship in Washington, D.C. And they wanted me to start before school ended. And I was just like, oh, I can't really go. And then we worked out a way where basically like I would go and start the internship early and just like fly over the weekend and then work from like Monday to Thursday and then fly back to Stanford and then you know take care of you know what I had to do and you know like be helping people move out and stuff like that and then fly back and then you know like I would fly back twice okay I was willing to do that and they were just like I can't believe you are threatening the lives of our students by being away from like I'm like girl you know how many times like you know like other like we are not all, and besides for like five dollars a day or whatever like you want to look what am i like 24 hour patrol like what the what what is your job and so she was like threatening me threatening me and the it's a weird feeling because i was just like oh yeah i thought you know like we were supposed to be on the same team uh i thought we were supposed to be like family and so i think for katie Definitely. Once you're at star athlete level at Stanford, the whole like elite part of the university like makes you feel like, oh, you're part of our family. And once that family just attacks you like this, you have to kind of think of it from her perspective of how traumatic that could be i mean i'm still remember little miss c and i call her little I, i'm i'm not that big but you know i call her little miss c only because my other mentor at stanford he's and he knew her and, uh, and i was just like i don't know i don't understand what happened to me i feel really bad about this and he's like sean don't pay any attention to the little people and i was just like what does that mean like i know she's little but like I don't think that's what you mean. She, he's like, don't pay attention to the little people. And now you know, it took me a few years after to finally understand. Basically, he was saying like, look, she was obviously abusing her position. She was using this in like this non issue to create some sort of soapbox for herself to try to attack a student like this and then after about being into in the real world now you realize there are a lot of people who do that and but then when you're that young you don't realize you think everybody is there at the university only there to help you and help you succeed and only have your best interests at heart when you know when then you realize a university is just like a, uh, any other uh, work environment. They're recruiting from all over the place. And there may be some people who, you know, want to attack or they probably just like, oh, you know, like, you know, miss soccer player. Like, you know, like y you never know. Uh, you never know who these people are truly. And so in her case, though, why should she question and and second guess 
and think badly that people have bad atten- intentions against her from the school. So it's a shock. It's a shock suddenly when you had so much trust and then boom. I'm telling you, it's literally an attack. So if you want my opinion about this, I think this email against her was extremely weaponized on a, on like a Patriot missile level. And it just literally was an ambush attack at 7 p.m. when, you know, when, you know, like when in real war, when you attack at night or if you attack over the holidays, you know, when the troops are drunk or something, they think nothing's going to go on. And then she, they say like, oh, you have until Monday to respond. That is an attack. Anybody, anybody who is older than 22 will know that that is a strategic attack when you're 22 you were so confused about like how can my own family attack me and how can everything be taken away in an instant and i think that that's what she was feeling so i hope that her legal team at least does something for the family i don't know whether it can be really resolved legally and i hope stanford can settle this so that it doesn't become like a huge thing but i'll tell you it is scary when the world's number one university goes against you or it's if one of the little people at the university try to use the heft and weight of the world's number one university to do something on their own and in some ways you can't just ignore the little people because sometimes the little people are holding missiles and they're throwing them at you and in this case i think the parents need to throw them right back at the little people not the whole school because the school is good okay so you know and even condoleezza you know i don't really agree with her politics but she you know real smart real classy real elegant thank you for not running me over in your mercedes all those years ago all right well what do you guys think Leave your comments below. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. And see you again next time. Bye-bye, guys.